Islam, a graduate of Christian Seminary C. Why am I talking about these two books? The one, Religious Literacy, the other one, Stephen Carter's Culture of Disbelief. The reason I'm talking about these two books is that that's the context in which I grew up. A situation where most of us in the United States of America are religious illiterates. Not only are we illiterate about other people's religions, so most of us are religiously illiterate, right, number one. And number two, they're encouraged to treat it as a hobby. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wassalamu ala rasulillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. After praising Allah, or praising the Creator, and sending blessings upon this Prophet, his last Prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him, I'd like to first of all thank the people of India for welcoming me for this my first visit and making me feel very, very, very comfortable in your home. I would also like to thank the Islamic Research Foundation for its invitation to involve me in what is one of the world's largest and spectacular efforts to re-educate the Muslims on the one hand and reintroduce Islam to the non-Muslims on the other hand. May Allah reward them all for their efforts. Stephen Prochero, in his book entitled Religious Literacy, and is one of several books, I'm a college professor, as was pointed out before by trade, so uh, if you're taking notes, you might want to take down the books that I offer in my discussion, because in this short uh, talk, we won't be able to get into depth into many issues, and these books, both by Muslims and non-Muslims, but mainly by non-Muslims, because we're talking about from Christianity to Islam, mainly by non-Muslims will give you further insight into the things that I'm saying here this morning. So Stephen Potero, uh, in his book, Cultural Religious Literacy, makes the following statement, maybe more or maybe less. He says, when you look at the United States of America, you find a situation in the United States of America where the United States of America is one of the most religious countries on the first face of the earth when measured by two indices. The United States of America is one of the most religious countries on the face of the earth when measured by two indices. One, the number of people who go to religious services, and two, the number of people who over and over and over again uh, profess to believe in God. The number is more than 90% as polled by Gallup, G-A-L-L-U-P. In this situation, Professor Prothero finds something that he calls shocking. In this situation, the situation where the United States of America is one of the most religious countries on the face of the earth, he finds a situation that he calls shocking. And this is in the area of the primary title of his book, Religious Literacy. Listen to some of the data that he uses for his assessment. When you look at teenagers in America, only 10% of them can name even one of the five major religions in the world. Only 10% of them can name one of the five major religions in the world. 15% of them at the other end can't name any. When you look in another area, two-thirds of the people in the United States of America believe that the Bible, the book the Christians call the Bible, that's shared by the Christians and the Jews, the book that they call the Bible is a book that answers most or all of life's basic questions. Two-thirds of people in the United States of America believes that the book that they call the Bible answers all or two-thirds of the major questions of life. But on the other hand, 
only about 50 percent, only about half of the people in America, over against two-thirds who believe that the Bible has the answers to the basic life questions, only about half of them can name even one, even one of the first four books of the New Testament. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When they ask, you know, they believe, most of them believe, over 66 percent believe that this book, the Bible, can answer most of life's questions, but apparently they don't know much about it because you ask them to name the first four Gospels, which contain the primary story from the Christian's uh, standpoint of Jesus Christ, they can't name it. This is a serious, shocking situation as far as concerned, and further, he points out that when asked to name, when asked to name the first book in the Bible, the book of Genesis, the majority of people in the United States of America cannot name them. Why the reason for this situation? If we look at another author, Stephen Carter, another Stephen, who's on the faculty of Yale Law School, one of my alma maters, is fat. I didn't finish the law school, but I went there two years. In his book, his classic book, another book, second book, uh, called The Culture of Disbelief. The Culture of Disbelief. This book was written in 1993. It's a classic in the area of understanding the religious dynamics in the United States. Professor Carter makes three important points out of several. Number one, that people in the United States who are religious are encouraged to treat their religion as a hobby, H-O-B-B-Y. That people in the United States who are religious are encouraged to treat their religions as a hobby, H-O-B-B-Y. The second thing is that there is an effort, an attempt to drive religion from the public square. That is to say that if you say that you take a position on a political issue of the day, say health care in the United States right now, which is a hot issue, and you say that the reason that I'm going to do this is because I believe in God, then from the perspective of the average American, their eyes will roll back, according to Professor Carter, and they will not like the idea of you bringing religion into what's called the public square. The third point that he makes that's uh, appropriate to what we're discussing here is that we in the United States of America have misunderstood the First Amendment. That is, the First Amendment that keeps the state out of the business of religion really says, in essence, that the state shouldn't establish re religion. It's called the Establishment Clause was meant to protect religion from the state, not the state from religion, and that we've got it all backwards. Why am I talking about these two books, the one, Religious Literacy, the other one, Stephen Carter's Culture of Disbelief, and the conversation about From Christianity to Islam, a graduate of two Christian seminary speaks. The reason I'm talking about these two books is that that's the context in which I grew up a situation where most of us in the United States of America are religious illiterates. Most of us are religious illiterates. Not only are we illiterate about other people's religions, most of us, and that I would say from my experience of teaching young people coming into college, it's true because I teach in a world religions department, it hasn't changed since Dr. Carter, or Professor Carter wrote his book in 1993, and it hasn't changed since the 2007 book that's come out. So most of us are religiously illiterate, right, number one. And number two, uh, one of the reasons I believe this way is because people are encouraged not to put religion in the center of their lives in the United States of America. They're encouraged to treat it as a hobby. So what I'd like to do in my topic, from Christianity to Islam, a graduate of Christian Seminary Speaks, is talk about five shuns. And by shuns, I mean T-I-O-N. Strange well way to spell shun, but listen to me. Five shuns. Connections, reflections, rejections, redirection, revolution.
five shuns, connections, reflections, rejections, redirections, and revolution. The first shun is connection. One of the reasons why the move from Christianity to Islam was relatively easy in some ways, hard in some other ways, but easy in some ways, is that there's a connection between Christianity and Islam. In an earlier talk in the same hall, I talked about the fact that Christians and Muslims, and parenthetically the Jews, are biological, linguistic, geographical, ethical, theological cousins. Biology, because in the Muslim narrative, we trace our lineage, both the Christians and the Muslims and the Jews trace their lineage back to Prophet Abraham, peace be upon him. We say linguistic because the founding languages, the founding languages from a linguistic point of view of these religions, Hebrew for the Jews, uh, Jesus Christ spoke Aramaic and some Hebrew, and Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, spoke Arabic. All of these languages belong to the Semitic language group. They're cousins, right? So it's biological, linguistic, geographical. They come from the same part of the world, what we call the Middle East today. Bethlehem, Nazareth, these are places that we know to be in the Middle East. Mecca, Medina, in the Middle East, Jerusalem. These are all places that are in the Middle East and in the middle of conflict today. So they're biological, linguistic, geographical, ethical, and we use the example of the Ten Commandments that Muslim Christians and Jews generally agree, except on the matter of the Sabbath, particularly for the Muslims, with the Ten Commandments you find in Deuteronomy and Exodus. And they are theological cousins because all three of these ways of life profess to be monotheistic. All three of these ways of life profess to be monotheistic. They all profess to believe in one God. As we shall see, it's expressed very differently in Christianity than it is in Islam. So that's the connection between the two. They're cousins. They come from the same part of the world, similar languages, similar ethical systems, and similar theological worldviews. The second part is reflections. In looking at this second part, I like to offer that my context from which I came in Christianity was the Southern Black Baptist context. The context from which I came in Christianity was called the Southern Black Baptist context. That is, I was raised in the South, even though I was born in Baltimore, Maryland, I was raised in Roanoke, Virginia, I was raised in the South, and I went to church, went to Sunday school, went to Bible study, went to choir rehearsal. I went to all of these things at High Street Baptist Church in Roanoke, Virginia. And so this is a Southern Black Baptist context. And one thing you need to understand about the Black or African American ex religious experience in the United States of America is that it's very expressive very expressive. That is, if somebody is giving a sermon, there's call and response. Amen, tell it, preach, talk, that kind of thing. And it's often built around music because it's part of that expressiveness. My existential understanding of myself, my understanding of who I was as a Christian at that particular time, was to a large extent shaped by the music that I heard and the lyrics that were embedded in that music. My existential understanding of myself, that is my personal understanding of what it meant to be a Christian when I thought I was a Christian, was to a great extent determined by the music I heard and uh, the words embedded in that music. As a side note to you parents out there, we are now very much in oral O-R-A-L, and oral, A-U-R-A-L, society in the United States. I don't know what's happening here in India. I don't know what's happening in other countries. But you hardly walk the streets in the United States without seeing young people connected to iPods, 
connected to music, connected to uh, music that their favorite music. You, there seems to me that they're connected to this music seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Hear me, whatever words they're listening to are very important to their self-understanding as they develop, so you ought to pay attention to this. And so I'm going to use the example of three pieces of music from my experience as a Christian to show how this shaped and formed who I was and helped move me from Christianity to Islam. So next thing we're going to look at is reflection. And we'll use a Christian hymn known, the name of which is Jesus Loves Me, uh, written by Warner in 1860 and then uh, music was uh, added to it in 1862. And it goes uh, something like this. I hope no one will be offended by me trying to sing it. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak and he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. For the Bible tells me so. All right. At six years old, I was taught to sing this song over and over and over again in the angelic choir of High Street Baptist Church. What I learned from this song, from singing it and like-minded songs over and over again, was the notion that there was a biblical authority, there was a, an authority, there was a, a authority of the book, before the Bible tells me so. What I learned from this is that God, as I understood it then, Muslims, we would say, we seek refuge from this, but God, as I understand it, loved me. This was affirming me as myself. Jesus loves me, this I know, and the Bible told me so. And so this was very important. This was affirming who I was. It taught me that God loved me. And it also, the underpinning of this was the notion that that God, that creator was omnipotent and all powerful. And that made that affirmation even more important to me at that particular time. Upon reflection, this was a very, very important part of my existential understanding. I would argue that the foundation for my love for Allah or my love for Creator was laid then, even though the belief system was incorrect, the foundation was laid at that particular time. And it was a positive relationship with my Creator. It was a positive relationship with my then deen or my way of life, my religion, that helped shape my existential understanding of myself at a very, very young age. So we've looked at connection. That's a reflection. So when did the rejection begin? I offer a second hymn. It's called The Old Rugged Cross. It was penned in 1912, I believe, by an evangelist by the name of Brenner. And by the way, when I was singing these songs, I always thought they were very, very ancient. But you notice, you know, 1862, 1912, and, and the name of this hymn is The Old Rugged Cross. Uh, the lyrics go something like this. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and the best for a world of lost sinners were slain. And I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Now, to the extent that Jesus loves me was affirming and uplifting and reinforcing the old rugged cross was just the opposite. It was depressing. It was disempowering. And it was discordant. It was depressing. It was disempowering. 
and it was discordant. Why do I say this? It's depressing. Understand, even if you use the Christian text as a source, there is no reason to argue that the cross should be the symbol of Christianity, except that the church made it so. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. Now, people talk about Christianity being about love, but the cross is the emblem of suffering and shame. How much more depressing can you get? The emblem of suffering and shame. For I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners were slain. Now, why is it disempowering to sing this thing over and over again? For I love that old cross where the dearest and the best for a world of lost sinners were slain. Well, this whole idea of vicarious atonement is an idea that disempowers an individual. The reality is, if you believe, as most Christians believe, that Jesus died for the sins of everybody in the world, the people before him and after him, where is your sense of agency? Where is your sense of ownership of what you do? Uh, I went to a seminary. I went to two seminaries, actually. Uh, this case was Yale Divinity School. And uh, we often, as many schools do in the United States, have spring break just before the Easter weekend. And uh, I was in a classroom just before spring break, and it was the run-up to what they call Good Friday, you know, old rugged cross, symbol of suffering and shame. What's good if you feel that God is crucified? This is probably where the idea that God is dead in the 1950s and 60s came about because people were being reinforced with this kind of ideology. But anyway, I was in a classroom of the seminary uh, the weekend before spring break where the Easter holiday was about to start. And remember, seminaries in the United States, probably as they are in India and other places in the world, are places for preparation of religious leadership. These are not your average people. These are people who are being trained to be religious, uh, clerical, and lay leaders in the Christian church. And uh, it's not your average people because it's at Yale University, one of the top universities in the world. So I walk into the classroom, and one bright, young person, male or female, because men and women go to Yale University Divinity School, had written on the board just before this Easter slash spring break weekend. There's an interesting dichotomy there. Anybody knows about spring break in the United States, they let it all hang out. They do things they wouldn't normally do, drink alcohol, participate in behavior that they wouldn't normally participate in. And it's often connected to Easter, which is one of the major Eids, the major holidays of Christianity. But at any rate, this is the weekend before that break. And one enterprising young person had written on the uh, board, Jesus died for our sins, vicarious atonement. Vicarious in a sense that someone else is doing something for somebody else. Atonement, we call it Tauba. We call this returning back to Allah, repentance, turning back to Allah, vicarious atonement. So the person wrote on the board, Jesus died for our sins. Therefore, we owe him a few good ones. Think about that for a moment. Think about the logic implicit in that. That is, because Jesus died for all sins, for all time, for everybody, I'm not responsible for my sins because Jesus died 2,000 years ago. You might call this simplistic thinking, but this is the thinking of some of the top minds who are training to be clerics in the United States of America. This is the problem with vicarious atonement. It is disempowering. It takes a sense of agency in relationship to what I ought to do in order to be a person of faith away from me and injects the idea of original sin, which we as Muslims don't believe in, that we're all sinful and falling short of the glory of God. We don't believe in this notion. It's a disempowering notion 
and it leaves us with the idea that somehow, no matter what we do, no matter how we act, the love of Jesus and the blood of Jesus will bring us through. Those of us who've heard Christian sermons have heard this over and over again, that the love of Jesus and the blood of Jesus will bring us through. So it's this empowering, this notion that of vicarious atonement. It's also discordant, D-I-S-C-O-R-D-A-N-T, discordant. Why do I say this? Because it clashed with my idea of God being all-powerful. It's discordant because it clashed with my idea of God being all-powerful, all-powerful. How is it? that a God that professed to be all-powerful in the book called the Bible would empty himself out, become flesh, become crucified on a cross in order to save humanity. The Muslims say, kum fayakum, be and it is. That's how powerful this God is. Why would it be necessary for this kind of drama, that's what it was, this kind of blood sacrifice in order to save people from sin when God created everything and has power to do anything, but it seemed that somehow it was necessary for to make God into a man in order to make him closer to us. And so this is discordant, not to mention the fact that we're told that this happened on a weekend and that Jesus was in the tomb for three days and that three days only extended through two nights and two days. Friday was Good Friday and Sunday, confusion. Not to mention the fact that the Sabbath that Christians follow is Sunday because of their belief that Jesus Christ was resurrected on Sunday. And I want to tell you that many Christians today believe that when the Bible says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work, but on the Sabbath day keep it holy. They think that the Bible means Sunday. Not so. Confusion. Why? Because this commandment is in the Old Testament. This commandment is in Deuteronomy and Exodus. This is the Torah. This is the book of the Jews. And when they say, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work, and on the Sabbath day keep it holy. They mean the Sabbath that the Jews observe today, the Sabbath that runs from sundown on Friday till sundown on Saturday. And millions, millions of Christians today in the 21st century when you have access to all kinds of information still believe that when they recite that commandment from the Old Testament that it means Sunday. Confusion, vicarious atonement, confusion, three days in the tomb, two nights, two days, confusion. And so this began to lead to my beginning to think about rejecting the faith of my family. So we talked about connection. We talked about reflection. We talked about rejection. So we want to talk a little bit about Redirection. I want to offer you another book, a book by John Gager, and it's called Kingdom and Community. It was written in 1976. In it, Gager talks about his view using sociological tools that what Christianity was as a social grouping, not as a theological group, but as a social grouping, was a revival, was a revival of the faith of Judaism. What Christianity was, as a social grouping, was a revival of the faith of Judaism. In other words, when you take a good look at Christianity, and, and the, this is a reasonable argument to make since Jesus was ethnically Jewish, it really was an attempt to reconnect the community at that time with the original covenant between the Jews and God. And there's a, this is a reasonable argument to make simply because Jesus Christ was Jewish, his disciples were Jewish, and the fact of the matter is is that we Muslims believe that Jesus Christ 
was in fact sent only to the Jews. And this kind of position, that is this idea, sort of reinforces it as emphasized by Gager in his book. And so when we look at it, we can see the relationship between the two, between Christianity and Islam. And at this time, remember, I'm still in Christianity, and I want to offer a final song that uh, reinforce my both my uh, discordance and the rejection of some of the basic ideas of Christianity. It's a song that was written in 1934. It's called Santa Claus is Coming to Town. You better watch out. You better not out. You better not cry. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. He knows when you are sleeping. He knows when you are awake. He knows when you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. Oh, you better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. Now, this seems like a harmless song. This is why I say, you parents, you should be listening to what your youngsters are listening to. But let's deconstruct it for a moment and look at the kind of ideas were implanted in me as a young person who thought I was Christian. First of all, it fantasized. In other words, it made the Christmas holiday, which was supposed to be about the birth of the Christ child, it put it in the realm of fantasy. People tend to know more about Santa Claus than they know about Jesus Christ. Remember what I said earlier about people not even know what the first four books of the Bible are. Likelihood is that they haven't read them uh, recently. They probably read Clement Moore's Twas the Night Before Christmas. It was Clement Moore's poem, Twas the Night Before Christmas, that popularized this idea of jolly old Saint Nick. So in 1934, we have a song that says, you better watch out, you better not cry, you better not pout, I'm telling you why. So it took it into the realm of fantasy, right? It fantasized, and then it humanized, and again, another human being is just like this whole idea of vicarious atonement. It humanized jolly old Saint Nick, even though it's somebody who could, uh, uh, it's fantasy life, because he can go down everybody's chimney all over the world, this is what I was taught, all over the world at the same time on, the, on Christmas Eve. But what's more important, he knows when you are sleeping. He knows when you are awake. He knows when you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. I want you to think about this for a moment. Who is the entity that's omniscient like this, knows when you're sleeping, knows when you're awake, knows when you've been bad or good. This is the creator. In fantasizing and humanizing this idea around Christmas, they transfer some attributes of the creator to this mythical jolly old elf. He knows when you're sleeping, knows when you're awake, knows when you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. You don't be good for the sake of your Christianity you don't be good for the sake of Jesus Christ. You don't be good for the sake of the church. You, you're good for the sake of this fantasy, this human fantasy, because you want presence on December 25th. Fine, the confusion about this, just like the confusion about Easter, the confusion about Jesus Christ being born on December 25th, the Christian scholars will tell you it's not so. Never mind that it was a compromise between pagan ideas and the church that December 25th and the idea of the, the soltists and pagan gods. Never mind about the confusion that comes about out of this. And no disrespect to people who may be in the audience of Christian, but you can go and check these things yourself. These are things that I was taught to a large extent after I was grown up and went to Christian seminary. So we have the revival and attempt by Islam to revive the faith. How do we know this? The prominence of Jesus in the Quran. How do we know this? 
Jesus' name appears more often in the Quran than Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Mary, the mother of Jesus, appears, her name appears more in the Quran than the name of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and the name of Jesus. Most of the time, like 21 times, it is in relationship to Jesus because he's known as Jesus, the son of Mary in the Quran. And so if we're Muslim, if we're Muslim, we honor, we honor Jesus Christ. Why? Because we believe in a virgin birth. Why? Because we believe that he worked miracles by the leave of God. Why? Because we believe he was the Messiah or the sent one. Why? Because we absolutely understand that, according to the Quran, that he was the word of God. That's why we honor him. We're to make no distinctions. It's back to connections, right? And so this is a revival. This is a revival of the faith of Jesus Christ. This is what Islam is. Because the reality is, is that much of what people say about Jesus and what they believe about Jesus, they can't find any warrant for it in their sacred text. I often tell my associates who are Christians that if Jesus Christ came back on Christmas or Easter and you invited Jesus Christ to your house, in the United States of America we have something called heavenly ham. That's an oxymoron if I ever heard one. Heavenly ham. This is ham that with sugar on it, right? It's heavenly ham. And it's a special treat for many people in the United States of America. They will buy it at Easter only, or they'll buy it at Christmas only, and they'll have a big meal, and they'll celebrate what they call the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, vicarious atonement at Easter, and they will celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ at Christmas. Jesus, an ethnic Jew, ethnically speaking, came out of the Jewish community, didn't eat pork, unless he was out of step with the, the community. And so I said, if he came back, you would even be able, he wouldn't be able to sit down at the table with you. So Islam comes to revive the ways of the original ways of the followers of Moses, peace be upon him, and the follower of Jesus Christ. Because these prophets, among others, are mentioned in the Quran, and how their people are treating them is mentioned in the Quran. And if you take a close look at the situation, you'll find out that in fact, in fact, that it is Islam, Islam that's closer to the way of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, than the ways that have been promulgated by the church and the commercial interests that have uh, taken it over. When you look at this Santa Claus, what we have is fantasize, commercialize, and humanize the creator. Turn God into a fantasy, jolly old elf. We've commercialized that most of the money that retail stores make in the United States of America, I don't know about in other countries, they make it in the run-up to the Christmas holiday. And so Christmas in many ways is more important to the commercial interest in our country than it is to the church. Fantasize, commercialize, and humanize. Humanize in the sense that a human being, even though it's a fantasy human being, is given attributes that only the creator should have. Attributes that only, only the creator should have. He knows when you are sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you're bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. So that's the fourth point. First point is connections. The second point, reflections. The third point, is rejections. The fourth point is redirection or the revival. And the fifth point, the fifth point is revolution. The fifth point is revolution, where we get into the details of how I actually became Muslim. The book I offer you this time is a book by a Muslim. 
named El Haj Malik Ash Shabazz, known as Malcolm X. Malcolm X was a major figure in my transformation from Christianity to Islam. How did it happen? It happened in terms of three different phases in my life leading up to my taking Shahada or the Declaration of Faith in 1979. The first phase was that I went to segregated schools in Roanoke, Virginia. Segregated schools in Roanoke, Virginia from 1952 to 1964. Those of you who know anything about United States of American history know that the Civil Rights Movement was going on at this time. Uh, many people date the Civil Rights Movement around 1957 uh, when uh, Martin Luther King started the Montgomery bus boycott. Uh, but the reality is, is that the Civil Rights Movement was fermenting at this time in the early 50s. Uh, and revolutions seem to be quick change, but usually there's been some preparation for revolution before the revolution happens. Revolutions seem to be quick change, but usually there's a fertile field that's been developed for revolution. The question is, whether you're going to grow beautiful flowers or weeds that are worse than what was before. And so uh, when we look at uh, the segregated school system that I attended, this was a situation that was very depressing. This was de jure segregation. This was segregation by law. It was illegal when I was a youngster. It was illegal for so-called blacks and so-called whites to go to school together. When I was a younger youngster, it was legal for, illegal for so-called blacks and so-called whites to marry. When I was a youngster, it was illegal for so-called blacks and so-called whites to ride on the bus in the same part of the bus together. This is the South that I grew up in. This is why it was so important to have the black church that affirmed me with songs like Jesus Loves Me, This I Know, because that was the situation I was in. That was the only place I could get affirmation in an institutional sense because we were in segregated schools. Everything was segregated. We lived in segregated neighborhoods. We were in segregated schools. We get secondhand books. We wouldn't get as much money as the so-called white schools. This was my situation, and this was the ground that I was in, and this was a situation that while I was in it, I didn't really understand the nature of oppression upon me. I wasn't born a revolutionary. I just thought that white people had always been in charge and black people had always cleaned their houses, always segregated from them, always were made to feel like second-class citizens. This was my reality. I went from that segregated school system. In 1964, I went to college. I went to a colored college, C-O-L-O-R-E-D, because that's what we called ourselves, colored. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People is a major civil rights organization in the United States of America. We call ourselves colored. Now we call ourselves black. We call ourselves African American. We call ourselves people of color. But back then, we call ourselves colored. And it was there, it was there, I began to reflect on the things I'd gone through in the church, the things I'd gone through in the street, and it came to a head when a speaker who was very active in the civil rights movement came to Hampton University in 1967. His name was Kwame Ture. He wasn't uh, a Muslim. Uh, his name was actually Stokely Carmichael at that time. He changed his name to Kwame Ture and then moved to Africa. And he died in Africa, actually. But the fact of the matter is he came to Hampton University and talked to us about our self-understanding our self-hatred, and how that much of the education that we'd had up until that point had taught us to look to other people for leadership and understanding. One of the things that we need to do as people is to affirm ourselves as human beings and not feel less than. This is part of the beauty of Islam, I want to say as an aside, that we can affirm who we are ethnically or nationally, and we don't have to give it up in order to say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. But at that point, when I was going to Hampton University, I didn't know much about black history or African-American history. And what Stokely Carmichael did 
It's challenged us this day to begin reading. I was already a bibliophile. I just wasn't reading any books about black people, pretty much, except books from the so-called uh, moderate civil rights leaders. And he, one of the books that he suggested that we read in 1967 was the autobiography of Malcolm X. The autobiography of Malcolm X. So I took his advice. I read the autobiography of Malcolm X. And this caused two major revolutions in my life. One, a revolution in terms of my understanding of race relations in the United States. The story of Malcolm X opened my eyes to the oppression that African Americans or black people or colored people or Negro people or whatever you want to call them have been subjected to since the time of them being brought there as slaves in the United States of America. I had never really understood this and his critique of racism in America opened my eyes to the evil of racism as something that I as a human being, simply because I was a human being, not because I was black, simply because I was a human being, was something I ought to do something about. So that was one revolution. The second revolution that I got from reading the autobiography of Malcolm X was a revolution in religious thinking a revolution and religious thinking. Those of you who know the story of, of Malcolm X know that his younger days were spent in the Midwest and he moved to Boston, got into trouble, fell in with the wrong crowd, was a street hustler, went to jail, and in the jail discovered what is called the Nation of Islam. He discovered the Nation of Islam, came out, joined the Nation of Islam, became a prominent minister in the Nation of Islam, became the national spokesman for Elijah Muhammad, one of the founders of the Nation of Islam. And then you know what? And this is making a pretty long story short. He found Islam itself. Upon making Hajj twice, he found that the racial paradigm that had been part and parcel of the United States of America, the racial model or paradigm that had been a reaction formation by the Nation of Islam didn't make any sense on the world stage. The ideas about race that white people were put together by an evil scientist, Yahoo, right? The idea that they uh, were the devil itself did not make any sense in the world of Islam that he was introduced to him when he traveled internationally. And so this brought me into a different phase of my life as well. And it made me, being the bibliophile that I was, and not a person who moves too quickly, began to read everything I could about Islam, every book I could about Islam, to find out any and everything I could about this religion called Islam. Because if this religion could take Malcolm X from being someone who was a colored boy from the Midwest, who was a street hustler from Boston, to be a minister for a religious worldview that didn't fit in with the basic tenets of Islam, to become somebody who had gone to the Muslim world and was accepted in the Muslim world, this is something that I wanted to know about. So I began reading. I began reading. I began reading. And I read all kinds of books. And over time, I became to the understanding that this Islam was the religion for me. I never joined the Nation of Islam because I never accepted its racial ideology. I never joined the Nation of Islam because I never accepted its racial ideology. Because its racial ideology, given the critique that Malcolm X made, didn't make any sense. Indeed, after he made Hajj, he wrote back to his friends in the United States to the extent that he said, I will never ever never ever talk about white people in the way I used to. This is because he made Hajj. I would never ever, and there are studies on this by the way, I think there's a study out of Harvard University right now that did a study, there's some people at Harvard University did a study on Hajj and uh, what they found out that people who made Hajj were much, much, much more tolerant than people who didn't make Hajj. That Muslims who made Hajj we're much, much more tolerant of other people and other religions than people who didn't make Hajj. And so what we understand here 
is that through this life-changing experience, Malcolm X saw the bright light of Islam. And through reading his book and reading other books and avoiding the racial ideology of the nation of Islam, I found a religion that gave me direction, the direction of serving my Lord, the direction of trying to get the Jannah, gave me the, the discipline that I lacked at that particular time, praying five times a day, fasting during the month of Ramadan, right? And gave me an opportunity to develop myself in ways that I didn't think were possible before. Indeed, it's the worldwide religion of Islam that even brings me to Mumbai. Because but for my relationship to a worldwide community, I wouldn't be before you speaking today. I wouldn't have spoken in Bahrain. I wouldn't have spoken in Doha. I wouldn't have spoken in Jerusalem. It, but for the worldwide religion of Islam that opened my eyes to the truth in relationship to God consciousness, that opened my eyes until the connection between all humanity, that opened my eyes to the evils of racism, I wouldn't be standing before you today. Gave me the direction, gave me discipline, gave me a way of developing myself. If you look at the Quran, you'll understand that what it's about, it's a book of justice. Surah 4, 135 has a very high standard in relationship to justice. It says, stand out, the meaning of which stand out for justice, even if it's against yourself, even if it's against your parents, even if it's against your kin, even if it's against rich or poor. This is a very, very high standard. But this is what Islam called me to and calls you to, a high standard of justice. You cannot be the leader of the world that Allah asks you to be in the Quran without this high standard of justice. I leave you with a quote from Malcolm X, since he had such a great impact on my journey from Christianity to Islam. And I think it's, it's a good place to stop and take questions that you might have about anything I said. He said before he died, I am for truth, no matter who speaks it. I am for justice, no matter who it's for or against. I am a human being first and foremost. And as such, I'm for whomever or whatever benefits humanity as a whole. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your hospitality. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. MashaAllah. Thank you very much, Sheikh Jimmy E. Jones. An abundance of information there for anyone who wishes to have friendly dialogue with our Christian colleagues. Um, you know, so inshallah, I myself will also be referring to some of the books that you mentioned before. Thank you very much. We've come to that time where we can um, entertain some uh, questions. Uh, we have uh, three microphones today. Um, I'd like to remind you, please, the questions should be on the topic um, of today's talk. It should be very brief, short, and clear. Uh, and also, please state your name and profession uh, when you ask your question. So, uh, I'm going to start with the sisters, inshallah, if you'd like to ask your question. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Uzma Khan. I'm a student of TYBSC. Question is, what is the idea behind confessions? If Christians believe that Jesus Christ died for the sins of the people, then why confess for sins which are already forgiven? Jazakallah. Uh, confessions, uh, question is, what's the idea behind confessions? If Jesus died for the sins of the people, what's the idea behind people coming to confess? The honest answer is I don't quite know, except that I know this is something to develop within the Catholic Church. As a matter of fact, uh, this is one of the reasons that we have the split between the Catholics and the Protestants, because uh, Martin Luther, uh, who wrote the famous 95 Theses, uh, was against something called indulgences. I mean, you could buy, that if you sinned, you could buy, indul aside from confessing, you could buy indulgences. An excellent book, by the way, to, uh, to if you want to read about this whole issue, uh, is uh, Sheikh Bilal Phillips, a friend of mine, Dr. Bilal Phillips, Salvation Through Repentance. Salvation Through Repentance. This is by Bilal Phillips, and it, it talks about this whole issue of confession, and it compares Talba or repentance in Christianity 
with repentance and Islam. And I think you'll find more specific answer to your question. Okay, excellent. Also, I just want to remind you as well that, you know, we do um, like to have a preference for non-Muslims who might like to ask some questions. So if there are any here today, then please come forward. We'd love to speak to you, inshallah. Uh, we'll take a question from the brother at the front here. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Alaikum uh, I'm Muhammad Shafiuddin. Brother, please correct me if uh, I'm wrong. The concept of God, belief in Christianity, will lead to the uh, crimes and will not uh, promote the peace between the human being. And also, please experience, uh, share your experience about the Christian, how they are thinking. The Christ died for sins. Christ, they also believe Christ as a, a God and also at the same time he died also. How can this world survive without the God? I think uh, with, uh, we're uh, limited to one question. That's right, one but, question, uh, yes. I'll answer the first one. I'll try to answer the first one. Uh, uh, isn't it true, I think the sense of that first question is that isn't it true that the Christian concept of God tends to lead to crime? Um, I would answer this in this particular way, that our responsibility, I'm not answering directly, I'll say it in the front, our responsibility, as I understand it from the Quran, and I'm not uh, a Mufasa, I'm not a scholar of Quran or Islam, my area really is comparative religions, um, but my understanding is that our role is to call people to Islam and uh, to call them in ways that are asin, the ways that are best. And I, I, my advice to all of us, and to myself first, because I'm closer, my mouth is closer to my ears, is that when we approach the Christians, that we uh, try not to accuse them, you know, we, we try to show them, when I talk to them, I try to show them as best I can that these things that you say about Jesus Christ, if you use your own sources, these things you say about Christmas, if you use your own sources, these things you say about Easter, you, if you use your own sources, are not true. Because I think that approaching them and saying that your belief in God is, you know, all the problems of the world come from there, is sort of what they're doing to the Muslims right now. Every time, uh, you know, we have something uh, going on in the world that has to do with T-E-R-R-O-R, -R -R, they want to blame it on Islam. And so I think uh, a more uh, wise approach uh, to Christians is to say, uh, come, uh, let's sit together, and I think the Quran says that, and let's, let's say that we should worship one God, and let's look at how you worship one God and how we worship one God. I think this is a better approach. I don't want to hazard, uh, honestly, a, uh, you know, an argument that uh, your concept of God has led to the problems in the world, because the reality of it all is that they'll, you can start around the finger pointing. And so look what the Muslims did here, look what the Christians did here. But this is not the point. Our point, like Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is a witness to all humanity. We are witnesses. We are witnesses for, uh, we're, no, uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is a witness for the Muslims, and we are witnesses for mankind. And my understanding for, to that, or humankind, my understanding of that, is that we are uh, excellent role models. And uh, if you've done any teaching, uh, there's an old saying in the United States, you can catch more flies with honey than you can with vinegar. And so I wouldn't uh, approach the matter in that way. Allahu alam. Jazakallah Please be reminded, all your questions are valuable. So if you can keep them short and one question at a time so we can get as many as possible. So back to the sisters again. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you, Dr. Jones, for sharing the story of your transition. We've benefited immensely. The work which you do in the U.S. to help develop Muslim American identity is commendable. Please advise what practical steps we can take to develop a Muslim Indian identity. Very, very important question. Uh, the work that we do in America trying to develop Muslim American identity is very important. What can we do? I, I, quite frankly, I'll be honest with you, I think in many ways you've done a lot more than we have. I mean, this peace conference is an example of the kind of thing that you do. Because what you're doing is that you're fulfilling a space that heretofore has only been filled by non-Muslim entities. That is, you're beginning to fill the airway, you're bringing Muslims together. Uh, one thing that really uh, shocked me 
when I came here is that there are young men who would come to me, young boys, and ask my autograph. Uh, my first inclination, because I'm kind of shy and feel like I don't want to call attention to myself and that any good that comes, comes from my Lord. But my second thought is, is that these young men are looking up to me, you know, as someone important in their lives, they're 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 years old. And so, uh, first of all, these kinds of things are absolutely important. The second thing is that we must support positive families we must build our own educational institutions. These are two critical things. There is no way, there's no way, no way that we're going to have a strong Muslim American or Muslim Indian identity unless we support families. What do I mean by support families? Support Shura in families. Be against domestic violence in families. I don't know if you have that problem here. We have this problem in the United States where men won't take Shura with people in their families. They think because they're the head of the household, they should be able to make all the decisions right down to the smallest thing in the household. When the Quran has a chapter called Shura, has a chapter called Shura, and that if you look at the Tafsir Ibn Kathir, one of the attributes of those people close to God are people who make consultation. And so, of course, it goes without saying that the kinds of physical and emotional abuse that we see going on in American families, I don't know if you have it in Indian families or not, is something that not the way of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. I challenge anybody to show me in the seerah of Prophet Muhammad, the biography of Prophet Muhammad, the kind of meanness that we see inflicted upon women in particular, but also children within the family settings. Unless we strengthen and develop this institution, we're not going to raise strong, positive Muslims. The other thing we need is our own educational institutions, and I think Again, India is far further ahead than we are. In the United States of America, a Catholic young child can go from kindergarten to PhD in a Catholic institution in the United States of America. That's not tr true with Islamic educational institutions. We're just developing them. But these are the things, you know, that we're working on, that we're focusing on. One, the family, and we're focusing on healthy marriages as well and two, developing strong educational institutions that give people the kind of, quote, secular education they need, but is deeply grounded in what I call the contextualization of the prophetic paradigm. Inshallah, I hope this has been use useful. Thank you. Brother in the front, remember, please, a clear question and very short as well. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Muhammad Nuruddin. I'm a student from Malaysia. I have a very simple question. What is in Islam that attract you to choose to be a Muslim? Uh, the, the discipline, the devotion, direction. What I mean by discipline, I, I come from a situation where I, was, I grew up in, uh, not so much in the inner city, but I grew up, uh, I lived for uh, much of my time in the inner city where I saw a lot of chaos around me. And so uh, the, the praying five times a day was attracted to me. The notion that of social justice was attracted to me. And the notion that it was clear that the Quran has a clear message for me in terms of the unity of our Lord, the unity of mankind, and what we need to do in order to have a hope of getting into the Jannah. It was so clear. I loved it. Intellectually, it attracted me. It touched my heart. And it structured my life. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, brother. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Muzambi Sheikh and I'm a student. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, one of my friend, Sean, he's Christian. He believes in the returning of Jesus, peace be upon him. But at the same time, he believes in the, he died on the cross just for the sake of our sins. So how can I explain him that this concept does not exist? The first thing, uh, in terms of giving dawah to people, uh, the first thing I urge upon people is to be nice to, uh, to the Christians first. That's the first thing. I mean, remember, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, uh, the angel Jabril, alayhi salam, used to impress on him to be kind to his neighbors so much that he thought, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, thought that the angel Jabril was going to ask him to leave him in his will. So the, the, the best dawah, as far as I'm concerned, is our conduct to be kind, to be courteous toward them, and to be gentle. And again, Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran that we should call them in ways that are asin, ways that are best. So you know the personality as your friend. 
better than I do. I, I can't tell you exactly how to approach this person, but you know, you, you know from being around this associate. And I would say what I would do is look up some of the information that I talked about and gently say, why, why don't you read this? Because all the things, I, most of the things I talked about except the autobiography are by Christians. You know, there are books called like Who Wrote the Bible? And there's a book called The Passover Plot. It's called The Passover Plot. I don't know the author of hand, P-A-S-S-O-V-E-R, The Passover Plot, where it's argued that uh, Jesus wasn't really crucified, that was fake, just like the Quran says. There's lots of people out there amongst the Christians who are saying this whole idea of vicarious atonement doesn't make any sense. What I would do, if it's a reading person, I'd get a person maybe one of those books and let them read it and have a discussion about it, what it means, and don't try to rush the person, inshallah. Remember, it's only Allah to Allah that changes people's hearts, it's not us, and so we can't force people. We should call them, be kind to them, and pray to Allah to Allah that their hearts are changed and that you get the barakats from it, inshallah. Mashallah. Sheikh uh, Jimmy E. Jones, we have to thank you very much for that wonderful talk. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, so we can't entertain any more um, uh, questions for now. Um, but, you know, mashallah, just to remind you all, just when you are, you know, talking with your Christian colleagues, as the Sheikh said, you know, please be polite and, you know, inshallah, your, the results will be very rewarding. So, uh, again, thank you very much, Sheikh. And uh, we will close on this session now. Um, and uh, obviously, we have more in store for you. So please be patient with us and enjoy the rest of it. So, Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.